Pride High, Book Two, Orange, written by J. Bell, narrated by Talia Carver. Chapter One, November twenty sixth, nineteen ninety two. Cameron Huxley's entire body was tense, much like it had been earlier this morning in the shower. He didn't expect to feel the same explosion of relief accompanied by a rush of endorphins, although he was thinking of Anthony just as much, despite the drastically different setting. A spread filled the kitchen table, all the staples of a Thanksgiving feast. The turkey was a collaborative effort with his father, who rarely cooked, but when it came to grilling, barbecuing, or anything else involving meat, Trevor took an active role, often waxing nostalgic about how he'd helped his own father with such things. Cameron felt like he was being indoctrinated while helping him, in a good way. Their relationship wasn't the closest, especially with Trevor being out of town on business most of the week, so Cameron welcomed the time spent with him. He had helped his mom as well, baking a sweet potato pie from scratch with her. Their collective efforts ended there. Most of the food they were now gathered around was straight off the shelf, including the stuffing, cranberry sauce, and gravy. They'd mostly only needed to open boxes and cans, sometimes adding water. The green beans and roasted potatoes were all him, though. Cameron wanted the holiday to go well. Needed it, too, with an urgency that made his stomach churn, because lately his parents' relationship seemed to be getting worse. He was terrified of what that could lead to. They were already isolated from the rest of their relatives, and had been since moving to Kansas more than three years ago. If his parents split up... Cameron imagined a raft, a primitive version made of tied-together logs. The rope was their bond, and if it frayed any more and broke, they would all be set adrift. The food on his plate was forgotten as he tried to imagine how Thanksgiving would work if they got divorced. "'When did you fry bacon for the beans?' Brenda asked, his mother taking another bite while waiting his answer. "'I didn't,' Cameron admitted sheepishly. I was feeling lazy and used bacon bits instead. You know, the salad kind? Trevor scoffed, his thick features skeptical as he took a bite and chewed. His hair was darker than Cameron's, dark walnut rather than English chestnut, and they shared the same build. Trevor had played football in high school, and had probably been brawnier than Cameron was now, but he had clearly inherited the broad shoulders and strong chest from his father. He watched Trevor swallow before looking surprised. Not bad. They must use real bacon. Cameron decided not to correct him. The label had specifically mentioned imitation bacon bits. He had taken note, intending to recommend the product to Anthony, who didn't eat much meat. The tension began to drain from Cameron as he thought of his boyfriend. Ever since they'd met, the sun seemed to shine brighter. Or maybe it was all in his head, considering how short and wet the days had gotten. But it sure felt like summer whenever Anthony strolled through his thoughts which was often. Cameron almost wished it was a normal school day, just so they could see each other, or that Anthony had joined them for this meal. Cameron was eager to introduce his boyfriend to his parents. That would happen soon, no matter what. They were both going to come out, to everyone at once, according to Anthony. That seemed crazy to Cameron, but then he was still reeling from everything that had happened over the weekend. They'd nearly lost a friend to suicide. Honey, Brenda said. Uh-huh. Cameron noticed his parents staring at him expectantly. Your next play, his mother prompted. I was asking when we'll be able to see it. In just a few weeks, Cameron said. We're really down to the wire. Speaking of which, I know it will be a pain, but can you guys park outside the garage this weekend? I could use the space to get caught up. Fine by me, Trevor said but it seems like an awful lot of effort to go through just to hone your skills. Cameron shook his head. What do you mean? Trevor cocked an eyebrow and shifted in his seat. Can't your shop teacher find better work for you to do? Or even that furniture salesman you hang around with? At least with him, you earn a commission. He was referring to Charles, who was an antiques dealer, not a salesman. But that wasn't what had Cameron so confused. What difference would it make? He asked. I enjoy the work. Fine, Trevor said. Just make sure you don't end up on Broadway. He grinned as if seeing humor in his own statement and seemed to take it personally when they didn't react the same way. 
You know what I mean, he grumbled. What's wrong with Broadway? Cameron challenged, his tension finding an outlet. Is it the work you don't respect, or the people? Take it easy now, Trevor said, raising a hand to ward him off. I simply want what's best for you, and we both know it's not going to be that. Cameron opened his mouth, intending to find out exactly what his father meant, but his mother got there first. When I ask you to take an interest in your son's life, Brenda said, this isn't what I meant. Trevor glowered at her, his tone sarcastic. Sorry, dear. From now on, I'll make sure to submit whatever I want to say for your approval. Maybe you should, Brenda retorted as she set down her fork. Cameron's own anger abandoned him, swiftly replaced by concern. This is exactly what he'd feared. It's fine, he said hurriedly. Dad's right, I don't plan on building stage scenery for a living, but it's still... You can do whatever you like, honey, his mother interjected. And this is why I don't bother, Trevor said, glaring at his wife while tossing his napkin on the table. You always undermine my authority. Brenda's eyes narrowed. I'm encouraging our son to follow his dreams. It's called good parenting. Guys, Cameron tried, you're teaching him to disregard my opinion. How would you feel if I did the same thing? Trevor turned to him. You don't have to go to school next week. Of course he does, Brenda shot back. Don't listen to your mother, Trevor said gleefully. Do whatever the hell you want. Please, Cameron tried again, beginning to despair. Let's just... That's not what I was saying, Brenda shouted over him. And you know it. Trevor shook his head. Apparently, I don't know anything until I've run it by you. Don't play innocent, Brenda sneered. You know exactly what I'm referring to. Cameron stood and slammed his palms on the table. Is this even about me, or am I just another excuse to pick at each other? His parents stared at him in shock. Cameron didn't lose his temper often, and it didn't feel good. Whatever, he snarled, turning and heading for the entryway. I'm full anyway. He took the stairs, two at a time, pressing his hands over his ears as soon as he was out of sight, so he wouldn't have to hear them blaming each other like they had done for years now. When he was safely shut in his room, he went to his stereo, grabbed a cassette tape, and pressed play after slotting it in. Then he almost cried, because the song was special. Ceremony by New Order. Anthony had made the mixtape for him, choosing music that captured how he felt, they had kissed under a willow tree while listening to it. That night had been the polar opposite of the toxic mess downstairs. Cameron knew what love looked like. Anthony proved that it was more than a dream. They had found it, together, and now he wanted nothing more than to escape into his arms. Except it was a holiday, and unlike Cameron, Anthony had plenty of family in the area. I made the mistake of complimenting my great-aunt's deviled eggs his boyfriend had told him recently. Now when she visits, no matter the occasion, she always brings half a dozen just for me, and expects me to eat them right there in front of her, which wouldn't be a big deal except they make me really gassy. And she's so freaking old that I'm worried she'll keel over if I tell her the truth. So you don't want to be around me on Thanksgiving, believe me. Cameron laughed at the memory. Those were the sort of problems a family was supposed to have, caring too much about each other. Instead of not caring enough, he found himself reaching for the phone, needing the comfort he felt in Anthony's presence. But he let it remain in the cradle, not wanting to intrude on a happy family just because his was so dysfunctional. He thought then of Mindy, how her parents had gotten a divorce some years back and were still living together peacefully. Maybe they had been just as bad as his own before that happened. He wanted to know, but again, it didn't seem like the right day. You can always come to me. I'll be a sympathetic ear. That was what she had told him on their first and only date, which had been a total farce. Yet he wouldn't change one bit of it, because that was the night he'd realized just how cool Mindy was. If she could handle going on a date with a closeted gay guy, an unexpected call on Thanksgiving wasn't likely to ruffle her feathers. Cameron grabbed his address book. Then he reached for his phone. He was the hottest guy that Mindy Beaumont had ever seen. This week, anyway. 
His hair was blonde and perfectly styled, his skin tan despite the late season. She watched pink lips frame perfectly straight teeth, the words he mouthed lost on her, but Mindy laughed along with the rest of her family, who seemed just as taken by him. More people than usual were gathered around the dining room table, but she was barely aware of them as her attention alternated between her sister, Jessica, and her new boyfriend, Brett, who really was incredibly handsome. Mindy twirled a lock of shoulder-length ginger hair around one finger as her attention lingered on his handsome face. Jessica seemed to be the only person not completely enthralled by him, but then Brett was only one in a long series of hunky guys who were all too eager to please. Which was frustrating, because if Mindy was in her shoes, she'd be fawning over him no matter how desperate it seemed. Piercing blue eyes met hers from across the table, as if Brett had sensed her inner thoughts. He stood while holding her in place with his gaze, then he swept his arm across the table, clearing it of food, and reached for her with transparent need. Jessica tried to pull him back down, but he shook her off because it was too late. Their hearts and souls had connected. The rest was destiny. The phone rang, jarring Mindy back to reality. Brett was indeed looking at her, although quizzically instead of passionately. She realized she was holding the gravy boat and vaguely remembered being asked to pass it to him. Her cheeks flushed as she set the gravy on the table between them. Then she launched herself out of her chair, muttered that she would answer the phone, and hurried into the kitchen. How long had she sat there staring at him? And why did her life have to be so embarrassing? She grabbed the cordless phone from the charging stand and moved deeper into the house. Even if the caller was a telemarketer, she would talk to them until her face stopped burning. Hello? she said after pushing the button to answer the phone. Mindy? She felt another kind of flush and didn't fight against it, because she genuinely liked Cameron. She thought he was handsome and sweet and wonderful to be around. Best of all, he wasn't interested in her. But not for the usual reasons. Cameron had never spelled it out in so many words, but he was already in love. With their friend Anthony. Cameron! she exclaimed joyfully. Hi! Happy Thanksgiving! Happy Thanksgiving, Cameron echoed. I'm sure you're busy. I can call back some other time. No, she said, perhaps a little too forcefully. It's good to hear from you. I'm so over this holiday. Same here, Cameron said, tension in his voice. My parents are, well, remember what we talked about? She did. I know exactly what you mean, and I'm so sorry. Holidays were always the worst. What about now? He croaked. Is it better since they split up? Yes. Maybe not during the first year when everyone was still getting used to the new dynamic, but now everything is nice and calm, like when we were kids. How does that happen, though? Cameron asked. How did your parents go from shouting at each other to being friends? Mindy nibbled her bottom lip. I mean, the divorce helped. Yeah, but most people just split up when that happens. I don't want to lose my family. I need... His voice squeaked and strangled to a halt. Was he crying? Are you okay? Mindy asked. I don't know, Cameron replied. That put her on high alert. She had learned very recently that you couldn't always tell how upset someone truly was. Are you having suicidal thoughts? No, Cameron answered instantly. Nothing like that. You're asking because of Ricky, aren't you? Yes, she said. I keep thinking of how terrible it would have been if... I don't even want to say it. Me neither, Cameron sighed. I keep worrying that he'll try again. He seems fine now, but that's no different than before, you know? I was clueless, Mindy said. He always seemed so happy. A little lost at times, but I never thought he'd try to kill himself. Exactly. How will we know when he's really okay? And why the heck am I complaining about my parents when some people have real problems? Yours are important too, Mindy assured him. I've been there. That's why I got into theater. Back in junior high, being around my parents was terrible then. I remember camping in the backyard with my sister one weekend just to get away from their bickering. Cameron sighed again. I wish it wasn't a holiday. I'd love to get out of here. Actually, screw it. I am going to leave. 
Mindy had wandered back toward the kitchen. She watched Brett say something, heard the table erupt with laughter, and felt the sting of envy. Can you come pick me up? Seriously? Will your family be okay with that? Mindy wanted to say that she didn't care, but she wasn't that rebellious. Just a sec, she said, setting down the phone. She walked into the dining room and cleared her throat. A few times. Her sister was the first to notice. Who was on the phone? she asked. Cameron, Mindy replied. The boy you went on a date with? their father asked. Mindy nodded. You have a boyfriend? one of her cousins asked, sounding way too surprised. Mindy decided to run with it. He's really upset. His parents might be getting a divorce soon. He could use someone to talk to. Invite him over, her mother offered. Kathy gestured to the table. There's plenty of food. I don't think he feels like being around a lot of people, Mindy said, squirming now that so many eyes were on her, including Brett's. He wants to go for a drive. I'd at least like to meet him, Kathy replied. And afterwards, Steve? Mindy turned, pleading eyes on her father. If he's upset, he shouldn't be driving, Steve said, before buckling under her stare. But if you parked somewhere, that would be fine. His eyes widened in panic. Not like that. I doubt anyone does that anymore, Kathy replied with good humor. Find a nice public place and talk there, okay? I will, Mindy said. Thank you. She rushed back to the phone. You can come get me, she said. But, um, would you do me a favor? Sure, Cameron said without asking what it was. He was so nice. Mindy hurried away from the dining room and whispered, Could you pretend to be my boyfriend? You don't have to kiss me or anything. My family just assumed and... No problem, Cameron said. You've already done so much for me. He left it at that. They'd never talked about how Anthony had crashed their date in jealousy, or what that had implied. She wanted to, though, more than ever because she really liked Cameron and didn't care if he was gay. She simply didn't know how to broach the subject. Thanks, she said. I'll be here. Hey, you know what we should do? We're both worried about Ricky. Why don't we surprise him? Make sure he knows that he has friends. That's a great idea, Cameron said. Even if his family tells us to go away, he won't forget that we stopped by. Let's do it. He sounded genuinely happy now, which made her own problems seem far away. Mindy might not have a boy who was madly in love with her, but she had amazing friends and couldn't wait to see them again. Chapter 2 November 26th, 1992 Riki Nishikawa hid a yawn behind his hand. Not that his father noticed. Ken's attention was glued to an old rerun of Star Trek. A local TV station had been broadcasting a marathon, and while Ricky liked watching the occasional episode with his father, the pacing could be slow, making time crawl by like it had all day. Their relatives lived on the West Coast, so it was only his parents and him this year. They'd already eaten together, Ricky picking at his food since he wasn't crazy about turkey, or most of the other Thanksgiving fare. Afterwards, they had reconvened to the living room. Ricky would have preferred playing on his computer upstairs. Or he could have sat around reading comics, or called someone, or jacked off, or any number of activities that used to be possible but weren't anymore due to a lack of privacy. His parents had been on edge since his suicide attempt, which was understandable but they were making it very difficult to be the happy, well-adjusted person they wanted him to be. This is a good episode, Ken said as the theme song played. Do you know who Captain Pike is? They actually used footage from the abandoned pilot episode for this one, and it's a two-parter. Ricky suppressed a groan, staring dutifully at the screen until the commercial break. Then he glanced around the living room and noticed that his mother wasn't there, which was odd, She'd been peering at him from over a book all afternoon. Be right back, Ricky said before standing and going upstairs. Once in his bedroom, he considered shutting the door, even though his parents didn't want him to. Not until he talked to a therapist, which he wasn't looking forward to. Ricky left the door open and went to his computer. He logged on to Side Streets, a gay-themed bulletin board system. 
once in the chat room, he thought of Jeremiah, the guy he had dated back in Colorado who had dumped him for a girl. All's fair in love and war, but Ricky wasn't ready for a second tour of duty yet. He logged out, typed the commands needed to launch his word processing software, and opened an article that he'd been working on. An op-ed piece, as Mr. Finnegan called it. His journalism teacher had asked Ricky to write about his suicide attempt, thinking it could help other students who might be struggling with the same urges. Ricky liked the idea of something good coming from the whole ugly mess, so he read through the article and made revisions, lingering on one line in particular. As soon as I could feel the pills kicking in, I knew I had made a mistake. I didn't really want to die. That's the tricky thing about suicide. If you're successful, you don't get to change your mind later. Ricky had tried explaining that to his parents. He didn't have a death wish, not anymore. If only they would listen. Ricky didn't need to see a shrink or be under constant guard. He wanted everything to go back to normal so that he could too. After saving his work to a floppy disk, he stood, intending to go back downstairs to watch TV. Except, just as he left his bedroom, his mother came up the stairs. And when she saw him, she stopped and stared. Everything okay? Amy asked. Yeah, Ricky said, shoving his hands in his pockets and leaning against the doorframe. He was convinced she had only come upstairs to spy on him and wanted to prove it. What are you up to? His mother didn't answer right away. Busted. I was going to change the towels she said at last. Oh, okay. He stood there and stared, giving her a taste of her own medicine. Amy looked him over. What's in your pockets? My hands. Anything else? Razor blades, cyanide, and the world's smallest rope to hang myself with. Ricky said this without humor. He pulled his hands out to reveal empty palms. Then he began patting himself down like he was being frisked. I know you think, his mother began, but the doorbell interrupted her. Amy's expression was just as confused as his own. Who could that be? No idea, Ricky said, already heading down the hall. He welcomed the distraction, not wanting to have another awkward conversation with his mom. He raced down the stairs and threw open the front door, his heart doing a gleeful backflip, because it was Cameron, the guy he had crushed hard on and, if he was honest, still had feelings for. Mindy was with him, which made Ricky almost as happy. They'd shared the same table in journalism for a while and had gone to the haunted houses together on Halloween. She was always nice to him. Happy Thanksgiving! The duo cried in unison. Ricky was speechless, but he did manage to gobble like a turkey. The others laughed at this. Ricky stepped out on the front porch, closing the door behind him. Are you busy? Mindy asked. No, Ricky said. I'm bored out of my mind. Same here, Cameron said. So we decided to have a Thanksgiving of our own. We're trying to find a fast food place that's still open, Mindy said. I want a milkshake. Come with us, Cameron said. I'll buy you an ice cream cone. Ricky briefly imagined sharing one with him, their tongues lapping at the ice cream and accidentally touching a bunch on purpose. That sounds... great. The door opened behind Ricky. He knew who it would be, even before he turned around. His mother was standing there while looking concerned. Oh, she said when eyeing his friends. You have visitors? Yes, he replied tersely. I'm Cameron, said the hunkiest guy in their school as he extended a hand. And this is Mindy. Amy shook hands with him while seeming amused. Mindy simply waved. How nice of you to stop by, his mother said. Do you mind if I hang out with my friends? Ricky asked. We've already eaten, so... Not at all, come on in. We were actually... Cameron began. Going to chill out here for a bit, Ricky finished for him. Oh. Amy's attention darted back and forth between Cameron and Mindy, but they looked so wholesome that even she couldn't find cause for concern. Now, if it had been Anthony instead, or Diego for that matter, she probably would have sat down on the steps to play chaperone. Have fun, she said at last before disappearing behind the door. Sorry, Ricky whispered. They keep saying that I'm not in trouble, but I totally am. 
I feel like a prisoner. Aww, Mindy said in sympathy. That's no fair. So, you can't go anywhere with us? Cameron asked. That's all right. We can hang out here. Under strict supervision, no doubt. I'm going with you, Ricky insisted. Whether they like it or not. He'd have to make a run for it, but as long as he got to have fun with his friends, it would be worth the consequences. He was basically grounded anyway. How much worse could it get? Wait in the car, he said. With the engine running. Is this a jailbreak? Cameron asked. Yeah, Ricky said, unsure how they would react. Mindy and Cameron grinned at each other, like this was exactly the sort of day they were hoping to have. Be right back, he promised. As soon as Ricky was through the door, he heard his father call from the living room. You're missing the best part. Wait until you see these aliens. I'll be right there, he lied. His mother wasn't around for once. Ricky took the stairs two at a time, grabbed a jacket from his bedroom closet, and made sure his computer was off before turning to leave. He noticed the floppy disk sitting on the desk and was struck by inspiration. Ricky grabbed it and went across the hall to the office, where his father's computer was. He inserted the disk, opened the file, and typed a command to print the article he'd been working on. The dot matrix printer was insanely loud, sounding like a screeching cat as it slowly printed one line after the other. He was certain his mother would walk in at any moment and demand to know what he was doing. She didn't. Maybe she was taking a nap. He felt guilty, thinking about how much sleep she had probably lost because of him. What he was about to do would make her worry even more. But Ricky was going crazy. He needed to feel normal again. At least he was leaving behind a note of sorts. The printer finally finished. Ricky tore off a sheet of paper at the perforated line. Then he darted across the hall to his room, left the article on his pillow, and rushed it downstairs. One beep for yes, two beeps for no, his father called when hearing him come down the stairs. Are you coming to watch the rest with me or not? Beep, Ricky shouted before slipping out the front door. A wood-paneled station wagon waited at the end of the driveway with its engine running, just as he'd asked. Ricky ran toward it. Mindy got out as he neared, holding open the passenger side door. He dove inside, the car lurching forward as soon as Mindy was seated again. They were all laughing as Cameron sped down the street. We did it, Mindy cried. They'll never find us, Cameron cackled. We'll change our names and move to another state. We should dye our hair, Mindy said. I'm going blonde. Me too, Ricky said with a grin. Same here, Cameron chimed in, putting on a funny accent. We'll tell everyone that we're a family from Sweden. Then we better pick up my big brother, Ricky said, thinking of the recent conversation he'd had with Anthony. For much of the school year, they had been rivals, competing for the same guys without even knowing it. They had hurt each other without intending to. Now they'd promised to bury the hatchet and start again, as friends. Brother? Cameron asked, sounding confused. Should I turn the car around? No, I mean Anthony. The guy that you're... He shot a glance at Mindy before censoring himself. Such good friends with. Ricky heard a delicate snort on his right. On his left, Cameron was biting down on his lower lip, but he didn't manage to contain the smile that broke free. Really? You want to include him? Ricky nodded. Why not? The more the merrier. Anthony Colon hated Thanksgiving. It gave his relatives the perfect excuse to repeat their favorite criticism. You're too skinny. Just look at your brothers. Don't you want to be big and strong like they are? You need to eat more. On and on it went. Enough that he was beginning to feel like he had an eating disorder, despite consuming three meals a day and snacking whenever he felt like it. Anthony was tempted to stuff food in his mouth until it spilled out and covered his chin just to shut them up. But he needed to save his appetite, because Great Aunt Dorothy would be here soon. What happened to your hair? His cousin Dennis asked. They were the same size and age, which was all they had in common. Dennis stared at him with a dull expression. Was it a dare? Anthony's hair currently went from black at the tips to pink in the middle and blonde when reaching the roots. He'd considered dyeing it before the holiday, especially since he still had half a jar of red manic panic, but he thought the three different tones looked cool, 
and his mother had agreed. He definitely had an easier time with her side of the family. Like him, they were thin and tended to think more than they spoke. All except for Dennis, who was still staring at him with lifeless eyes while waiting for an answer. My mom was practicing on me, he lied. She was a hairstylist, and always willing to help him experiment, but not because she needed the practice. His mom was awesome at what she did. Really? his cousin asked. Yeah, Anthony replied with a theatrical sigh. I didn't want her to touch my hair, but she said I'd be grounded if I didn't go along with it. Your parents don't do that sort of thing? His cousin turned to consider the living room, as if trying to remember who his parents were. Anthony followed his gaze. From the corner they were currently squeezed into, he could see a mass of bodies. His uncle's family was visiting from New Jersey, dominating their small house with their large frames and loud voices. Filling in what little space remained was his mother's side of the family, who were from the Midwest and trying very hard not to get in anyone's way. I would have let them ground me, his cousin said at last. Your hair looks like roadkill. Thanks, Anthony grumbled, even less thrilled to be sharing a bedroom with him for the next three days. As soon as Thanksgiving was over, he was going to ask Omar if he could stay at his house for the rest of the long weekend. Although he would rather stay with his boyfriend, even in secrecy, he'd already suggested the idea jokingly. My dad is in town all weekend, Cameron had replied, and that changes things. Anthony had kissed away his troubled frown, although now he wished he'd remembered to follow up on the strained undertones of that statement. But they'd continued to kiss, and... Anthony, he heard his mother call. Aunt Dorothy is here. Here we go, Anthony said under his breath. He stood and gave his cousin a nod, taking solace that Dennis would be the one smelling sulfuric farts all night. He'd make sure to sleep above the sheets so his cousin got a nice, heady whiff. Anthony dodged and squeezed past relatives until he reached the front room. His mother was already smiling at him like he was a saint. Aunt Dorothy stood next to her, tiny, wrinkled, and ancient. He liked her, too, since he'd always been her sweetheart, Dorothy said. You've gotten so handsome. Oh, I just adore your hair. She was great. Anthony kissed her on the cheek. He would have hugged her, but she was already holding out a small Tupperware container for him. I made your favorite, she said, her arms shaking with the effort. Except I forgot to put them in the fridge last night, and it was a long drive from Missouri, so you better eat them right away. Anthony's mother, Dawn, was already tacitly pleading with him. I've been saving my appetite, Anthony said, taking a circular container from her that was made for transporting eggs. Six of them, in fact. All for you, Aunt Dorothy said. Her makeup was heavily applied and slightly askew, and he absolutely adored how that looked. He only wished she didn't insist on cooking for him. His stomach churned in anticipation. Warm, day-old, deviled eggs. This was going to be a blast, literally. He was cracking open the lid when the doorbell rang. I got it, his brother Mike said, wincing when he saw what Anthony was carrying. I hope they're good, Aunt Dorothy said. I couldn't get to the store, and Harvey always buys the discounted eggs. Oh, God. He was going to die. Your little friends want to know if you can come out to play, Mike hollered, standing aside to reveal the open door. Three faces stared back at him, Anthony's heart filling with love. And not just because one of them was his boyfriend. He was happy to see Ricky and Mindy, too. Do you mind if I share these with my friends? Anthony asked. Great Aunt Dorothy couldn't have been more pleased. He's such a nice boy, she said, looking up at her niece. You did a wonderful job raising him. He makes me very proud, his mother said, shooting him a grateful expression. Do you mind if I hang out with him? Anthony asked, wanting to cash in on that credit. Not at all, his mother said. Have fun. Anthony hugged them both before he slipped out the front door and shut it behind him. He held up a finger before anyone could talk, and after a pause, sighed in exaggerated relief. 
It's madness in there, he explained. Another successful jailbreak, Cameron said, his voice filled with affection. Anthony wanted to kiss him, or at least hug him in an intimate way, but of course they couldn't do such things with witnesses around, not without revealing their secret, which he was sick of keeping, and wouldn't for much longer. They had decided to come out, to everyone, and despite how terrifying the prospect was, continuing this charade was even less appealing. Have you eaten yet? Cameron asked, eyeing the container of eggs warily. Thankfully not, Anthony chuckled. I want to get a milkshake, Mindy said. I'm hungry for a burger, Ricky chimed in. You mean real food? Anthony asked. Good, let's go. Ricky called shotgun on the way to the car. Then he looked over at him with concern. Anthony smiled to show it was okay. They both had feelings for Cameron, but he didn't think Ricky was the type to go after someone else's man, especially now that they were friends. Thank you for rescuing me, Anthony said as he climbed into the back seat. Maybe we should make it a yearly tradition, Mindy replied as she buckled up. I'm up for it, Ricky said. Me too, Cameron adjusted the rearview mirror so their eyes could meet. We still have room for two more. God, he was wonderful. He knew that Anthony had been, and deep down still was, madly in love with Omar, and yet he was still willing to include him in their plans. You all know who I'm voting for, Anthony said. I've got to represent my best friend. You mean Omar? Ricky asked before grinning enthusiastically. Mindy tensed. What about my best friend? You can't have one without the other these days, Anthony replied. Then it sounds like we have our lucky winners, Cameron said as he started the engine. Soon the station wagon would be nearly as crowded as the house they pulled away from. But it was fine with Anthony. The quality of the company made all the difference. And he couldn't think of anyone he'd rather spend the holiday with than his friends. Chapter 3 November 26th, 1992 Omar Jafari loved Thanksgiving so freaking much. He felt like a prince sitting at a long table covered in food, his extended family all around him. Everyone was dressed so sharply. Most of the women were wearing hijabs, including his mother, Anya, who had beautiful arching eyebrows that made her look wise, like a queen presiding over her court. And next to her was his father, the king, Yosef, whose bronze skin and thick black hair matched his own. Despite being shorter and swept back, Omar sometimes hoped he would look like his dad when he grew up. Maybe not the stylish glasses and carefully trimmed goatee, but the man knew how to fill out a suit. The other guys at the table were dressed just as snazzily. Omar was wearing a black button-up shirt and a white tie that his mother had helped him not. They had already stuffed themselves, but continued to chill around the table while snacking and sharing their news. Omar's cousin was talking about the colleges he'd applied to, and even though it was way too early to have gotten results, he seemed to be building up to something major. Omar leaned to one side and grabbed the camcorder under his chair, hoping there was still room on the tape, because he'd already filmed a ton today. I only wanted to make a good impression so they'd remember me when I sent in my application, his cousin said, already beaming. I never expected them to offer me a scholarship. The table erupted in surprised sounds before people began applauding. They recognized how much effort you've put into your academic career, Omar's uncle said proudly. You're exactly the kind of student they want, and they were smart enough to secure you now. Never heard of Chapel Hill, Omar said from behind the camera. Must be a good school though, right? One of the best for pharmacology, his cousin replied. Awesome, dude, Omar enthused. You're the man, his cousin flashed a smile. You should apply there, too. We could share a dorm room. That depends on what other programs they have, Omar replied. I'm way more into... He remembered who else was at the table, his arm jerking so the camera focused on his father, who was already smirking. Girls, Yosef asked. Omar was thinking of the film industry, he lowered the camera and grinned. I mean, you're not wrong. 
I do have news of my own. His relatives murmured in interest. They loved this kind of thing. Can I show them the photo? His mother asked. Anya stood, not waiting for permission. Ah, oh, man, Omar said, his cheeks flushing, but only because she had framed the photo, which seemed a bit much. Then again, Sylvia might be her future daughter-in-law. Aren't they beautiful? Anya said when returning. She handed the photo to her sister, who said flattering things before passing it down the line. It's nothing compared to a scholarship, Omar said, giving his cousin a thumbs up. Just imagine the babes of North Carolina. Believe me, I have, his cousin replied before withering under his mother's intense stare. I'm very proud of you both, their grandmother said. The framed photo had just reached her. Mamani only glanced at it before passing it along, because she had already met Sylvia. She's a fine girl, and it's a fine school. Good decisions lead to a happy life, as you are both learning. Thanks, Mamani, Omar and his cousin said in unison. They laughed, and the conversation moved on. When the framed photo reached him, he smiled at it before passing it down the row, remembering how epic his birthday had been. He was slow dancing with Sylvia when they'd posed for the photo. Just seeing her, even in two dimensions, stirred serious feelings inside him. Sylvia was such a cool chick. He could actually talk to her, and they had things in common, like their love for fishing or, hell, even crazy shows like Twin Peaks. Of course, his birthday hadn't been perfect. That was when they had found out Ricky was in the hospital. And at the end of the day, when almost everyone had gone home... I'm in love with you, Anthony had told him the truth. Omar felt like standing up and announcing that he had important news, because coming out seemed like an incredibly courageous thing to do. Who did that? As far as Omar knew, he'd never met someone who was openly gay before. Most people were probably too scared to admit the truth, but not his best friend. Anthony was a badass. He focused on the conversation again. His little sister, Yasmin was bragging about how many Girl Scout cookies she'd sold, without giving him any credit, but that was okay. He didn't want people to know how many cookies he'd eaten in front of potential customers, like a living commercial, while she gave them a sales pitch. He was eyeing the desserts on the table when the doorbell rang. Go get it, Omar said, shoving his sister playfully. Um, I'm talking, she sassed. So what? When he saw his grandmother raise an eyebrow at this, he patted his sister on the head and stood. Be right back. Omar walked to the door, lost in thought until he threw it open. Then he started laughing. Four of his friends were standing on the porch. They didn't let him get a word in as they began dragging him away. Jailbreak, Ricky cried. Can I have that tie when you're done with it? Anthony asked, pushing him from behind. Are you gonna maim it? Omar asked. Yep. Then maybe. Omar dug in his heels before they reached the porch steps. Hold up, where are we going? I was having dinner with my family. So was I, Mindy said, opening the back door of the station wagon. Live a little. Yeah, but... Omar tried. We're going to pick up your girlfriend next, Anthony said. Well, in that case... But no. Seriously, guys, hold up. His friends finally stopped jostling him. We're dyeing our hair blonde and moving to Sweden, Ricky said. And before that, Cameron interjected, we thought it would be fun to grab a burger and hang out. <laughs> that does sound cool, Omar said, glancing toward the house. But my entire family is in town. That's exactly what we're each trying to escape, Anthony replied. Don't tell us you actually like your family, Mindy said accusingly. What kind of teenager are you? Leave him alone, everyone, Anthony said. He does have nice relatives. We'll tell Sylvia that he couldn't make it. God damn it. I just need to let them know where I'm going, Omar said. I'll be right back. When he returned indoors, he was relieved to see everyone getting up from the table. That should make this easier. He approached his mother, since she was more lenient about such things. Who is at the door? she asked. My friends came to surprise me. They want to know if I can hang out? His mother's forehead creased. Not a good sign. Ricky is with them, 
he added hurriedly. It was, quite frankly, an inspired tactic. The boy who tried taking his own life? His mother asked, her face softening with sympathy. Yeah, I hope he's doing okay. Maybe that was a bit much, because her eyes narrowed in suspicion. I won't be gone too long, he promised. Very well, his mother said. But only if you help clean up when everyone is gone. He'd do all the dishes by hand if he'd meant he could see Sylvia. Thanks, Mom, he said, giving her a hug. He told the others that he'd be back later, including his grandma, who was reaching for the Persian love cake she made on a special occasions. White icing dripped over the edge of the round cake, the top decorated with green pistachios and pink flower petals. I've got this, Omar grabbed the cake stand for her. Wow, there's still so much left, he said as they began heading toward the kitchen, his grandma hobbling along with her cane. You know who I bet would like some? Your friends? Mamani asked, with a mischievous twinkle in her eye. Kind of, Omar replied. He'd been thinking only of Sylvia. But that might have strange results, Mamani said. You know the legend, don't you? He shook his head. Long ago, Mamani continued, a Persian peasant was in love with her prince, but of course someone so low in status was beneath his notice. She hoped to impress him during a festival when everyone presented their finest creations to the royal family, so she put all of her love into a new kind of cake, and when the prince tasted it, he knew he had found his bride. The cake made him fall in love with her? Omar asked. Mamani shrugged. So the story goes, but who can say? Would I need to bake the cake myself? Omar asked casually. Or does it work on anyone you give it to? I think we should find out, Mamani said, reaching for a knife. God, she was good. That's what he'd intended to ask from the very beginning. Although now he was even more excited about the idea. Mamani cut a thick slice for him that he put in a plastic container. After thanking her and grabbing his favorite leather jacket, he very carefully carried the cake out the front door. What's that? Anthony asked, pushing himself off the exterior wall. The others were waiting in the car. Dessert, Omar said with a grin. Your grandma's love cake? Anthony asked in interest. Omar wasn't surprised by his guests. Everyone loved her cake. She had baked three of them for the holiday. The other two had already been eaten. Yeah, can I have a bite? No way! Omar wondered if the cake really was magical, especially considering Anthony's recent confession. Sounds like you've already had enough. Huh? Nothing. I'll trade you some deviled eggs, Anthony offered as they walked across the yard. <laughs> no, and before you ask, you are not sleeping over at my house tonight. Last year was bad enough. I didn't actually eat the eggs this time, Anthony mumbled. Then maybe. There will probably be leftover cake when we get back. But you have to help me clean up, okay? Anthony recoiled at this suggestion. I need to consider my options. Is the cake for Ricky? I'm sure you'd appreciate it, considering everything he's been through. Dude, you know who the cake is for? Anthony grinned. Yeah, but I love fucking with you. They both laughed, and before long, they were rolling down the street, Omar keeping careful watch on the cake balanced on his lap. Time for some magic. Sylvia Diaz felt a rare sort of contentment. In the morning, she had joined her family in the kitchen, where they'd all cooked together. Even her little brother Hugo had helped with the simpler tasks. The radio had been on, her mother singing while they worked, which was cute especially when TLC's Baby 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 began to play. Elena had sung the chorus to Hugo, who took offense at being called a baby, so she'd sung to her husband instead, Miguel pulling her close for a dance. Everyone sat down afterwards to eat at a leisurely pace while chatting about the week. But soon even work and school were forgotten. Time seemed to stand still, their concerns distant, including her own. Even the feds took a break on Thanksgiving, she assumed. No one would be coming to tear her family apart. Her parents were safe. Everything was perfect. Her father seemed to share this sentiment. What a beautiful day, he said in his native Spanish. 
She helped him with the dishes afterwards while Elena took a nap on the couch not far away. The trailer didn't offer much privacy, but it was home, especially when they were all there together. She smiled at her father as they worked and wondered if Hugo would be like him when he grew up. They were both short and had the same pudgy belly, but of course only her father had a mustache. I only wish the rest of our family could be here, Miguel murmured. Your grandmother, especially. Do you miss her? Sylvia asked before shaking her head. Of course you do. She's your mother. When I was a kid, I never put the pieces together like that. Although I remember you crying sometimes when you got a package in the mail. Only because I was so happy, Miguel replied. Sylvia cocked an eyebrow at this. I'm not a little girl anymore. He seemed to reconsider her. No, that's true. We've grown up so quickly. He handed a wet plate to her so she could dry it. Or you've always been so grown up that nothing has really changed. But I'm not sure which. Miguel bumped his shoulder against her playfully. But yes, I do miss my mother and everyone else. Except maybe my brother. Your uncle was always a pain in the ass. Especially when we were growing up. Sylvia always liked it when her parents told stories about their lives back in Mexico. Now she recognized the emotions attached to the amusing anecdotes. Her parents hadn't seen their families since coming here. They received letters and photographs and managed the occasional call, but that wouldn't be enough to sustain Sylvia if she was separated from her own immediate family, especially not as the years went by. I wish they could meet you, Miguel said. I want them to know the beautiful and intelligent daughter that I have been blessed with. I've told them about you many times, but it isn't the same. He put an arm around her and squeezed. I love you too, she said. Although, if we had a spare wish, I'd rather give it to you, so you can see them again. Miguel shook his head and started rearranging glasses in the cabinet to make more room. My memories keep me connected to them. You've never met your family on either side. I'm worried that by the time you do, they'll feel more like strangers. But as you pointed out, you're not a child anymore. You're old enough to visit them on your own. And leave her parents behind, even for a week? She knew that was when something would go wrong. She could almost feel it in her bones. Maybe someday, she said. But not yet. When your brother is older then, you can go together. Before she could answer, there was a knock on the door. Sylvia looked to her father, mirroring the surprise on his face. Elena sat up on the couch and blinked. I'll get it, Sylvia said, her slumbering anxiety beginning to stir until she heard a voice on the other side. It's me, Mindy. Sylvia exhaled in relief and opened the door. Her best friend grinned before noticing they weren't alone. Hola, senora y senora Diaz, she said with a wave. Buenos dias, Mindy, Elena responded before adding in English. Happy Thanksgiving. Gracias, tu también, Mindy replied. She had decided to take a Spanish elective back in junior high shortly after they first met, and had stuck with it ever since. Just one of the many reasons that Sylvia adored her. Come on in, she offered. Mindy shook her head before tilting it to the right. Sylvia stuck her head outside the trailer and saw a station wagon parked nearby. Omar was leaning against it while scowling. I told him he had to wait in the car, Mindy explained. Sylvia laughed, told her parents she would be right back, and stepped outside. As soon as she was down the steps, Omar began walking towards them. Am I allowed to approach? he asked, despite doing just that. Yes, it's fine, Sylvia assured him. Thank God, he breathed. Your personal secret service agent is hard to get around. Sylvia smooched him when he was close enough and began walking toward the car because her best friend had done exactly what Sylvia wanted. Omar was a sweet guy, but she didn't know if he was mature enough to handle the truth yet. She didn't think he would have a problem with it or do anything malicious, but the game she'd been playing her entire life required restraint and tact, neither of which were his specialty. I could taste turkey on your lips when we kissed, he said. You're my Thanksgiving treat. Oh my god, Mindy said, looking mortified before she rushed away. Sylvia leaned against him. 
Save the weird talk for when we're alone. The what? Omar asked. Oh, you mean the romantic stuff. Exactly, she said. What's going on? Whose car is that? Sylvia watched as the doors opened and more people got out. She recognized Anthony, of course. They often hung out at the record shop where she worked. The other two she was less familiar with. Mindy had shown her a photo of Cameron in the school yearbook, before losing interest after their first date. As for the smaller guy, Sylvia tensed, remembering a few days ago when a young man had stumbled in front of her truck and passed out in the middle of the street, hitting his head on the pavement in the process. He had nearly barfed on her after she'd helped him up. That was when she'd learned that Ricky had taken a bunch of pills, intending to kill himself. She had rushed him to the urgent care center, and once learning that he'd be okay, quickly left again after the receptionist promised that Sylvia would be a local hero. The last thing she wanted was for the spotlight to shine on her, or her family. Hey, Cameron said, extending a hand and introducing himself. She reciprocated, her attention darting back to Ricky, because she wasn't sure how much he remembered. None of it, hopefully. Hi, Ricky said with a wave. We were supposed to meet sooner, except... Well, anyway, I've heard a lot of good things about you. From me, Omar supplied helpfully. And from me, Anthony said with a smile and a nod. How are things? Good, Sylvia focused on Ricky again, watching him closely for a reaction when she said, It's nice to finally meet you. Yeah, he replied. He didn't grab the sides of his head as a sudden memory came rushing back, nor did he point an accusing finger at her. Ricky's grin was carefree as he said, How do you feel about Sweden? Sylvia stared for a moment longer before answering. I've never been there, but that's where Abba comes from, so it can't be all bad. Agreed, Anthony said. You know, I was just listening to their... Nope! Omar stepped between them with his arms outstretched like a traffic guard. No music talk. We're on an important mission. I'm dying for a milkshake, Mandy said. And the boys want a burger. Come with us. I already ate, Sylvia said. Same here, Omar said. But there's always room for something sweet. True, Sylvia admitted. The others cheered. Jailbreak number six, Ricky said, high-fiving Mindy. Sylvia laughed, and after they explained their plan, went back inside to tell her parents where she was going. While inside, she thought about the gift-wrapped VHS cassette hidden in the bedroom she shared with her little brother. Ricky had dropped it when passing out, and she hadn't noticed that it was still in her truck until after she'd fled the hospital. Sylvia didn't know what to do with the gift, which was intended for Omar, but how could she explain why it was in her possession without giving away the rest? She toyed with the idea of bringing it along and leaving it in the station wagon, but surely that would raise even more questions. She decided to ignore the issue for now and rejoined her friends. Soon she was in the back seat, Omar and Mindy to either side of her. What's in the Tupperware? Sylvia asked her boyfriend. He was gripping the square container on his lap, only letting go with one hand to seek hers out. You'll see, Omar replied. Just don't order anything, okay? And if you don't want it, Anthony said, turning around in the front seat, let me know. Okay, she replied, none the wiser. We should do a potluck next year, Ricky said. I tried one of the deviled eggs. They're really good. You what? Anthony demanded. Was I not supposed to? Ricky asked. There were six, one for each of us, I thought. So while we were waiting for... How long until it kicks in? Cameron asked, looking over in concern. Anthony shook his head. There's no telling. What's going on? Ricky asked. You guys are freaking me out. Omar guffawed. <laughs> Remember that scene in Alien when the facehugger exploded out of the dude's stomach? Don't ruin the surprise, Anthony said before turning to Ricky. Here's the good news. If you want your parents to give you more space, I think we've found a solution. Sylvia remembered the time that her mother had made Hugo eat all the broccoli on his plate and began laughing. They cruised around, searching for somewhere to eat. All of their favorites were closed, so they drove farther out of town, settling on a soulless fast food chain. 
They claimed one corner of the dining area, the ashen-faced employees not caring that so few of them bought anything. Anthony ordered fries, Mindy finally got her shake, Ricky opted for the kid's meal and refused to react when the others teased him, especially when he started rolling the included toy around. What? he said. It's from Tiny Toons. I love that show. Omar seemed to be waiting for the right time to reveal what was in the Tupperware he continued to guard. When the others began talking about an upcoming movie, he gestured for her to join him at a nearby table. I hope you like this, he said after they sat across from each other. Omar took off the lid and pushed the container toward her. My grandma made it. Wow, Sylvia said when seeing the contents. That's beautiful. The scent made her mouth water. Are those real flower petals? Yeah, Omar said sheepishly. Kind of weird, I know, but you can't eat them. Really? Sylvia asked, not hiding her delight. Yeah, go ahead. Omar passed her a plastic fork which seemed much too commonplace for such a fine delicacy, especially when the first bite melted in her mouth. She tasted a hint of almond, reminding her of the Mexican wedding cookies her mom sometimes baked, but also a hint of citrus and an almost perfume-like flavor that might come from the rose petals. She wasn't sure. All she knew was that she wanted more. Omar's eyes were shining as Sylvia shamelessly ate three more bites. Mmm she said after swallowing. Wow, I know people joke that food can be as good as sex. <laughs> Not that either of us would know, Omar murmured. But yeah, it's hard to imagine sex being better than that. Sylvia was about to take another bite when she glanced over at the others. Anthony was watching them but quickly looked away. I should share this with them, she said. Omar shook his head. It's just for you. He smiled bashfully before adding, it's Persian love cake, that's why. That was sweet, both figuratively and literally. Do you want a bite? She asked. Nah, I already had like three pieces earlier. At least I won't taste like turkey anymore, Sylvia teased. Omar grinned. Do you want me to check? She ate another bite first. Then she leaned across the table so they could kiss, but it was playful rather than passionate. Feeling self-conscious, she checked the corner of her eye and caught Anthony watching them again. This time he didn't avert his gaze, even when she turned her head toward him. He smiled at Sylvia in a way that seemed more resigned than happy. Anthony often had an edge of sadness to him, although not so much when they were alone and listening to music at the record store. He seemed perfectly happy then. Unless Omar was at the store too, and attempting to get affectionate with her, that was when she would see the same sorrowful expression, which made Sylvia wonder if Anthony had feelings for her, and not for the first time. She had straight up asked him before, and he had denied it, while blushing. Maybe he hadn't felt free to admit the truth. She was dating his best friend, after all. Sylvia held up a bite in offering, despite Omar's wishes. Anthony shook his head, took a deep breath, and slid out of the booth. "'Hey, everyone.' he said as he stood. There's something I need to tell you. The others fell silent. Anthony swallowed before continuing. I didn't expect to do this here, he said, glancing in the direction of the indoor playground. But I guess you have to start somewhere. And really, most of you already know, or probably suspect. Sylvia had no idea what he was building up to, but his face was flushed as he took another deep breath. I'm gay. This was met with silence until Omar said, Hell yeah you are, and I think it's awesome. I do too, Mindy said, clapping gleefully. Anthony flashed her a grateful smile before checking on Sylvia, but she was too stunned to react. She kept waiting for some sign that this was a joke, but the vulnerability on Anthony's face was genuine. He turned toward the booth as if seeking the reaction of the people sitting there. You know I'm cool with it, Ricky said. Anthony didn't reply. He seemed to be waiting for something. What was going on? She noticed how red Cameron's face had become. He seemed to struggle with himself before he finally stood up, walked over to Anthony, and took his hand. And when he did, 
Sylvia felt electricity shoot through her. She stared at their clutching hands as her pulse began to race. Cameron cleared his throat. I've got something to say, too. I'm madly in love. With this guy right here. Anthony seemed to relax. He turned toward her again. This time she managed a supportive smile. That was only on the surface. Her insides were going crazy. Sylvia couldn't figure out why, unless... What if she had gotten it backwards? Maybe she had feelings for him. Chapter 4, November 26th, 1992 How does it feel? Ricky asked as soon as he was alone in the car with Anthony and Cameron. They had just dropped off Omar and were driving toward his own house, where he would no doubt get in trouble. Rather than focus on that, he was eager to talk openly. To come out? Cameron asked, looking at him in the rearview mirror. Ricky would have gladly continued sitting between him and Anthony up front, but they'd made him get in the back on the previous stop. That made sense. But if he was Anthony, Ricky would have taken advantage of the extra space by scooting over and cuddling up to Cameron. Yeah, to your friends especially. I've only told my parents. Although he had admitted the truth to Diego, if he counted as a friend. It's a huge relief, Anthony said. You never know how people are going to react. Mindy was a sure thing, Cameron said. And Omar already knew. Yeah, but I've known them forever. Sylvia was the real test. We haven't been friends long, Anthony exhaled. I figure that's what it'll be like at school. Even the people I get along with might have religious reasons for not liking me. I've never talked to Sylvia about that sort of thing. What if she's a devout Catholic? It would have hurt if she didn't want to stay friends. I'm glad you guys went first, Ricky admitted. I totally would have come out after you guys, except... I get enough stares lately. You're staying in the closet? Cameron asked. Ricky nodded. For now, I'd rather let everyone get to know me better before they find out. That, and I'm nervous about an article Mr. Finnegan might publish in the school newspaper. He wanted me to write about my suicide attempt. That's a great idea, Cameron replied. Yeah, Anthony said with humor in his voice. Just let me come out first. That way people will forget all about me when they see your article. I wouldn't mind, Ricky said with a grin. I'll distract them with my suicide attempt, and you'll make it passe for anyone to come out after you, including me. You could write your own article, Cameron said, glancing over at his boyfriend. About us or about me? Anthony shot back. Even from the back seat, Rick could feel a tension that suffocated further conversation. They pulled up to his house shortly after, forcing him to acknowledge his own problems. It was nice knowing you. Ricky said as he reached for the door. He didn't open it yet. Hey, do you kiss when you say goodbye? Each other? Cameron asked in confusion. Ricky nodded happily. I don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, you're the one who's leaving, Anthony pointed out. Yeah, I know, but I'm about to get seriously grounded, and I'd feel better about it if at least I got to see two guys kiss. They laughed at this. Cameron raised a quizzical eyebrow. Anthony shrugged. Then they leaned toward each other and smooched, Ricky applauding afterwards, because he'd kissed a boy before, and done plenty more, but witnessing it was something else entirely. Even if he did still feel envious of Anthony, Ricky would have gladly traded places with him now. He slid out of the car, tromped toward the house, and was barely in the door before his mother came rushing toward him. He braced himself in anticipation of the lecture that was about to scorch his eyebrows, except all his mother said was, Thank God, before she squeezed him close. Then she held him at arm's length while looking him over. You're okay? Yeah, he said. I just needed to hang out with my friends. You needed to feel normal, Amy said, her tone sympathetic. I read your article, honey. It's beautiful. Really? he asked. You aren't mad? I've never been angry with you. Not about this. Her eyes searched his. I didn't know what to think. Now I do. So everything can go back to the way it was? I won't have to see a therapist? 
Amy sighed. Maybe I should write my own article, so you can understand where I'm coming from. Her chin trembled. Then again, I hope you never experience what it feels like to nearly lose your child. Honey, I need you to speak to a therapist. Do it for me, so I won't worry as much. And in return, I'll try not to make you feel like you're being punished, okay? He nodded, and when his mother hugged him a second time, Ricky felt like he was finally home again. Frustration and relief. The two emotions shouldn't coexist, but they spun harmoniously inside Anthony, making it hard for him to know exactly how he felt, although he was certain of one thing. I don't want to go home yet, he said. Me neither, Cameron replied. Willow Tree? Anthony nodded, and for a moment a light shone from his heart, reducing the other emotions to mere shadows. The station wagon pulled over next to an empty field where a lone tree could be seen in the distance. This was a special place for them. Cameron had once sat under the willow while dreaming of someone he had never met, and when he'd decided Anthony was that person, Cameron had brought him here to tell him so. They had kissed for the first time beneath the tree, the memory taking the edge off his frustration, but he still wanted answers. What happened? Anthony asked as they walked across the field. Cameron didn't need him to clarify. I wasn't given any warning. You've been wanting us to come out since we met, Anthony shot back. I thought it would make you happy, like a Thanksgiving surprise or something. Instead, you just sat there, Cameron asked. Anthony exhaled, relieved they wouldn't be arguing about semantics. You stood up eventually, but it felt like an eternity before you did, and you didn't look happy. It's not you, Cameron said, his voice raw. Or us, I promise. Anthony reconsidered him, his own needs no longer important, because something was wrong. What happened? Cameron swallowed his eyes watery and filled with lingering concern. We're good, Anthony assured him. I promise, I just want to understand. They had reached the willow tree, its long drooping branches brushing the ground. Cameron used an arm to part them like a curtain so they could enter. Come here, Anthony said, settling down with his back to the trunk. He hooked an arm, his boyfriend soon filling the space. Tell me, please. My parents, Cameron began. Another argument? Cameron nodded. Except this one was about me. He explained what had transpired and finished with, They must have had a conversation about me recently. My mom let that much slip. She knows you're gay, right? Cameron nodded. She must. I don't know if she talked to my dad about it, or if the Broadway comments were random. Either way... He seems to think that being gay is a choice, and a fate that is best avoided. Anthony grimaced. I'm sorry. I wouldn't want to come out either if my dad said horrible things. That's not it, Cameron said. I can deal with him not approving of me. It's the way they were arguing about it. I don't want to be the reason my parents finally get a divorce. Anthony tried to imagine how terrible that would feel. And yet, he couldn't help asking, Would it be so bad? If your parents are always fighting, maybe they'll be happier if they separated. I mean, nobody wants their parents to split up. But is it ever going to get better? I don't know, Cameron said, not sounding offended. I've had similar thoughts. But there's more to it. Like what? He watched Cameron clench his jaw a few times before he shook his head. I'll tell you, but I want you to meet my mom first. You'll understand better afterwards. Okay. Anthony freed his arm so he could take his boyfriend's hand. You don't have to come out to your parents. Not for me. I want to, Cameron insisted. The timing needs to be right, that's all. So when you came out today... You were thinking of your parents, Anthony finished for him. 
and you stood up anyway. Which makes it twice as meaningful that you did. Thanks, Cameron said with transparent relief. We'll take our time, Anthony said. Our closest friends know. That's the most important part. I'm still trying to figure out how to tell my parents anyway. I'm sure as hell not going to with so many relatives around. Are you worried what they'll think? Anthony snorted. Not really. I just know that they'll make it tedious. And like you've pointed out to me before, my parents are probably fine with me. I'm way more intimidated about coming out at school. There's no rush, Cameron said. Anthony shook his head. There is. Because I bet we're not the only ones. Ricky was telling me about a study. I can't remember the name of the book, but it claimed that one in ten people are gay. Cameron whistled in a way that sounded impressed. That's way higher than I would have expected. Same here. Even if those numbers are wrong, and it's one in a hundred, or even a thousand, there are other gay people at our school. The prospect of coming out to everyone is intimidating, but I won't let that stop me. He thought of Ricky, and how events would have played out differently if they'd been honest with each other from the start. Ricky had nearly killed himself while Anthony clung selfishly to his secret. He wouldn't let that happen again. Too much is on the line. It might be the difference between life and death. You're right, Cameron said. Parents get divorced. That happens. And people survive it. If someone else tries to take their own life, my problems don't matter compared to that. They do to me. Anthony squeezed his hand. Let me go first. I'll come out and be a beacon of hope. Or whatever foolish delusion I've convinced myself of. And you can wait until the timing is better. I don't mind. Cameron looked pained. You know what I used to imagine? Back when the idea of having a boyfriend was still a dream? I always pictured walking down the school halls with him, hand in hand. That's the way to come out to everyone. I'll look dumb holding my own hand, Anthony teased. But I'll try my best, for you. This coaxed a smile out of his boyfriend. They remained in the embrace of the willow tree, their voices meandering through subjects both serious and silly, until the sun became a humble orange sphere on the horizon. Then they stood and brushed themselves off. Time to go home? Cameron asked. Almost, Anthony said. Before we do, I need you to help me dig a shallow grave. Five of them. At least fifty paces from this tree, if not more. Cameron searched his eyes. Then he laughed. The deviled eggs? Anthony nodded solemnly. We'll have to sprinkle holy water over the graves, or nothing will grow on that spot for centuries to come. They returned to the car and gathered what supplies they needed. Anthony and Cameron looked for the best place to hide a body, and once they found it, began digging. When finished with their work, they marked the spot with a crucifix, fashioned out of the real estate signs that always cluttered the back of Mrs. Huxley's station wagon. Then they swore a solemn oath to never tell others of their crime, before searching the horizon for unwanted witnesses. As far as Anthony was concerned, it was the best possible way to kick off the holidays. November 29th, 1992 Time to go home, dude. Even if your relatives are still there. I need to jack off. Omar noticed the way his best friend's attention darted down to his crotch and up again before his face turned pink. Unless you want to stick around and watch, he added, the pink graduating to red. Anthony rolled his eyes before he stood and began gathering his things, glancing over his shoulder at one point to ask, You didn't find time in the shower? Nope. Between you and my sister, there's hardly been any hot water. I've only had enough time to soap up and rinse off. And now I'm crazy horny, so you've got to go. Before I lose control and start playing pocket pool right in front of you. Anthony spun around. Would you stop? What? Omar asked innocently. Just imagine if you were friends with a girl and she said that kind of thing to you. Omar replayed the conversation in his mind. I'd think it was super hot. And I bet you do, too. Anthony shook his head and continued collecting his stuff. 
Unless it bugs you, Omar pressed. I'll stop it if it really does. Like, if it's torture that you can't have my body or something? You wish, Anthony grumbled. Maybe it used to be like that, but these days I mostly think about my boyfriend. Mostly, huh? Omar asked. So you do fantasize about me? Anthony grabbed Omar's camcorder and held it high above his head, threatening to let go. How bad do you want to know? he asked. Omar laughed. I'll stop. But it is flattering, really. He added when Anthony narrowed his eyes. If I was gay, I'd be over the goddamn moon that you're into me. Or were. Either way, Cameron is a lucky guy. Thanks, Anthony said, seeming appeased. Sylvia is a lucky girl. I would have gone down on you after getting that love cake. Right there in public. Just don't tell your grandma. <laughs> we'll keep that between us. Omar walked him downstairs and opened the front door. It was fun hanging, he said. Yeah, thanks for letting me escape the madness, Anthony grimaced. See you tomorrow at the other insane asylum. School. After five glorious days off, Omar was anything but ready to return there. He bumped elbows with Anthony before they parted. Instead of going upstairs for some lonely action, Omar wandered into the kitchen to see if there was any leftover cake, which was a mistake because his father was sitting at the dining room table while paying bills and had one of those looks on his face. Sure enough. Did I hear Anthony leave? Joseph asked. Yeah, Omar confirmed. His father nodded at the chair across from him. Take a seat, Omar complied. He wasn't sure what they were going to talk about, but he had a few guesses. Aside from when he got a little too edgy, his dad was usually happy with him. They got along well, all things considered. That would only last a few more weeks when report cards came out. I think we can call Thanksgiving a success, Yosef said amiably. Everyone seemed to have a good time. Did you? Yeah, I'm eager to go over the footage I filmed. I want to put together a video for the whole family. We can make copies and send them out for Christmas. Great idea, his father said with a hint of hesitancy. Although, perhaps for New Year's instead. Yeah, of course, duh. Most of his family was Muslim and didn't celebrate Christmas. His parents had always made an exception, despite their beliefs, to spare Omar and his sister from feeling left out as children. But it was the little kid version of Christmas that was all about Santa, decorating trees, and, best of all, presents. Sort of like how celebrating Halloween had nothing to do with its pagan roots, although that would have been a better holiday for Jesus to come back from the dead. Christianity had missed a trick there. Omar's fingers twitched as he thought about turning that into a sketch, which reminded him of the topic at hand. Maybe I can do a video that looks back on the entire year? So it fits the theme. We could mail them out after the 25th so there isn't any confusion. Yosef nodded in approval. Let's plan on it. Sweet, Omar said, happy that his father saw value in his greatest talent, although the subject was quickly moved on from. Your cousin has done well for himself. Yeah, Omar said. A freaking scholarship. How cool is that? Very cool, his father replied. You could follow in his footsteps if you tried a little harder. Omar withered under this advice. I don't know. Pharmacology isn't my thing. That doesn't have to be your major. But you've got to decide on a direction, son. That's easy, Omar said. He pantomimed, bringing a camcorder to his right eye so he could peer through it. If he was actually filming, the camera would have captured the forced patience that steeled his father's features. You know how much I love crushing the gas pedal, Yosef said with an impish grin. Get me on a clear stretch of road and I'll bury the needle. What's that mean? Omar asked, leaning forward. His father checked their surroundings, making sure his wife wasn't around. It's when you max out the speedometer and keep going. Which you should never, ever do. I was young and dumb. 
Around your age, I even toyed with the idea of becoming a race car driver. But there's a big difference between a hobby and a realistic career choice. But I can do it for a living, Omar said. Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Mel Brooks? Want me to keep going? His father's dark eyes twinkled as he shook his head. You know I love space balls. Hell yeah! And you're right. Directing is a career, but only for a select few. How long would your list have been had I asked you to keep going? Compare that to the number of eyewear stores in this country. Most towns have at least one. Cities have dozens. The demand will always be there. It's not the same for the arts. If you succeed as a director, tastes can change and put you out of work. If you want to raise a family like I did, you'll need a stable career. His father leaned back to consider him. Now that you're 16, it's time to start making realistic plans. I'd like you to come work for me at the store. What's that got to do with anything? Omar asked. He could already imagine how little time he would have left. No more visiting Sylvia after school or hanging out with Anthony on the weekends. He'd be spending all his free time at Jafari Eyes, selling glasses to bratty kids and boring adults. You don't appreciate money until you have to earn it, Yosef said. If college isn't an option, you can help your mother and me run the family business, okay? Omar reluctantly agreed. What else could he do? Insist that they keep spoiling him for the rest of his life? His family had more money than any of his friends. He recognized that and didn't want to take it for granted. But what about his dreams? He chatted to his dad a little longer before retreating to his room. Omar threw himself on the bed and stared at the ceiling, a hand slipping into his jeans. But it was no good. His dad had killed the mood. Omar tried thinking of Sylvia, which only reminded him that she already had a job. They were the same age now, and it would no doubt bug her that he relied on her to get around. Omar needed a car. His parents had given him the promise of a down payment for his 16th birthday, which was pretty great, but he'd still need a job to make the monthly payments and to fuel up. It wouldn't be the end of the world. He just didn't want to work for his parents. That would feel like giving up already. Then again, his parents' wishes weren't so different than his own. To become a director, he would need to get into a good school, the best he could manage. With a sigh, Omar rolled off the bed and grabbed his backpack, which was full of assignments that he'd been ignoring all week. Once the stupid homework was done, he was going to spend some serious quality time with a bottle of lotion and a box of tissues. The story continues as an audiobook, ebook, or paperback available at your favorite retailer. Visit www.jbellbooks.com to learn more.